Uriah Mountain Dreamer, in her famed poem, says, it doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you've studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself, if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. And I would add to her poem, I don't care what you promise me. I care that you follow your promises to conclusions, new awarenesses or fulfillments of your integrity. What I mean by that is that the world is made of broken promises and it's what you do with them that really counts. I can't list them now. They are probably too many and too numerous to count, but I have made you promises that I have never fulfilled. And if they hurt you, I apologize. But I hope you have the grace for me that I would try to have for you. And like the poet David Kirby, who has a yard full of broken promises, I do also. I'm sure you do too. The problem with them, I would propose, isn't that they lie there comfortable in their ingratitude, but that they don't lead to change. We can yell at them all we want, but if they don't lead us to change, they aren't worth much. I know many people, some of you out there, who grew up in homes filled with promises you got used to not being fulfilled. We will vacation there next time. We will buy you this or that. Let's have that for dinner tomorrow. And those things never happened. Those broken promises pale in comparison to the letdowns in life that left you at the altar rings in hand or looking at the empty bleachers for a parent who got drunk or worse. The problem with both the small and the large broken promises only comes if we weren't changed by them, challenged to become better than all that. That we didn't hold a new line for what we wanted to be because of them. That we ended up actually holding on to them as grudges and complaints against the world. I was trying to find a story with some integrity about this. A lot of them pale to real life examples, but I did remember the biblical story of Jacob and his uncle Laban. There's a bit of a misogynistic quality to it, but it's a story from a few hundred years before the common era, and it points to a truth. You might remember the story. Jacob, who's on the run from his brother for tricking him out of his birthright and his inheritance, goes out into the world, this future father of the tribe of Israel, a scoundrel really from the beginning, and he gets a piece of his own medicine when he lands at his uncle Laban's house. He makes a deal to work for his uncle for seven years in exchange for the hand of marriage with his younger daughter, Rachel. Seven years come up. He works day in and day out, and on the night that he is promised to, to wed, Laban sends into the darkened tent his daughter Leah, his oldest daughter. In the morning, they are married, and Jacob wakes up and finds out that he has been tricked, a promise broken. I guess a little trickery goes both ways. Jacob, though, doesn't turn on his uncle, or lash out, or leave, or abandon his relationship with him. He doubles down. Okay, I'll work seven more years and then marry Rachel. This was a time of multiple marriages, and he does. He completes the deal, and they're married. Rachel and Leah and Jacob go off to populate the tribe of Israel. Does Jacob or Laban change in that time? 14 years of promises and broken promises? The Bible isn't very specific on any of these conclusions, nor do they give voice to any of the women in the story, a common thing in the Hebrew scriptures, but the broken promises provides a model of sorts. To deal with broken promises, not to turn completely away from it, but to allow it to change you. I figure Jacob takes a week or so to come to that conclusion, that he can continue to work for what he wants, and he gets that, he gets that his trickery is just desserts, but I think it changes him. He doesn't storm off in rejection of his uncle. 
He doesn't dishonor Leah or leave her, or divorce her. He holds on to what he has promised to make it better. Now, not all promises are worth preserving at all costs. I will say that to you tonight, today. Not one of you who are divorced would defend the idea of having chosen a freedom for whatever kind of tyranny you have experienced or having been shown the mirror of your ways. That You would not say that one, you have, you have had to choose that promise over everything else. Not all promises are must to be fulfilled on the contrary. Some should break for the health and wellness of those involved. But all promises allow us to change and learn. All promises, especially the ones we have broken, which lounge around in our yards like old dogs, call us to self-assessment. So I ask you today, what promises have you broken? What corrections to the ones that you have made are possible? And what promised land do you envision for your life? Today I want to table for a moment campaign promises as we're in the middle of election season. Campaign promises so vivid in our minds as we approach these elections. We're well versed in the brokenness of politics and how promises are made and easily broken under the pressures or deliberate strategies of the political world. But while I have you there, I want you to promise to yourself two things in this season ramping up to the election. Maybe the most important election in the history of our democracy. I want you to promise yourself this. One, that if you are eligible to vote, that you will exercise your right no matter your despair or concern over the country. This is no time to sit on the sideline. This is no time to let yourself be swayed by complacency. Vote. We have an I Pledge to Vote card on our website, a link to it. I want you to print it, sign it, and put it on your mirror today. That is the first promise I am asking you to make today. But more to the point of the sermon today, the second thing I ask you is, I want you to envision your promised land, your internal spiritual promised land, a landscape that is within you, that you are aspiring to, that you attend to, a hope for yourself, a better you that has whatever in it you need to inch through your unfinished self. It can be a promise to live with more integrity, more honesty, more hope, more peace, more thoughtfulness, more groundedness, more joy, whatever the one thing you need to change in your life for yourself and the lives of those around you. Find it in yourself to make a promise today. Call it your promised land and then pledge to yourself that you will pursue it. And I want you to go to the next step and tell someone about it. Tell me what it is you strive for. Tell another minister in the church, tell a friend or a family member, what are you seeking and how? Knowing that like Moses, who led his people out of slavery and died on the hill overlooking the promised land, it doesn't matter if you succeed. It only matters if you gather up even the most precious spiritual promise that you can from your yard and feed it. It matters that you make that promise to yourself and try to arrive at the shores of its hope. The Texas poet, musician, Lyle Lovett sings the words you heard Ariel sing before this sermon began. Promises given and promises broken, words stain my lips just like blood on my hands. I say to Lyle, no stain of a promise is incapable of being washed away and is not a stain on your character or who you are forever. We all live with broken promises and those we never should have made. And we will make more. The chance is to make them right, though, and to learn from their mistakes. I want to close with Uriah Mountain Dreamer again. In this unfinished series in which we've said to you that your life is unfinished, 
but small steps can make it better and make it different. Remember, she says, I want to know if you can get up after a night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. Friends, her wisdom informs my final words today to you in this unfinished, I promise and promises broken sermon. I want to know what broken promises have changed you for the better. I don't want to know what spiritual heights you've accomplished. I want to know what promises you can make to change your spiritual life for the better today, for tomorrow, for the promised land ahead. And I want to know you. I want to know what you love. I want to know how you are whole. No matter what you have done, I want you to know that you are loved, that you are whole, that you live in a circle of forgiveness, always having a new chance at being who you want to be. And I want you to know that I love you all. Amen and amen.